of Stephen Farshing, and I'm Bilal Rouhani. And we did not coordinate the shirt color. So we're going to talk about agriculture and linguistics today, and the outline of our presentation. We're going to go through the existing emissions, sort of current trends, who's emitting what and how much. We'll talk about some abatement potential and mitigation strategies that our group identified as effective and important. And finally, Bilal is going to go through some barriers to implementing those as well as recommendations to overcome those. So for those of you who don't know what LULUCF is, land use, land use change in forestry, it's a greenhouse gas emissions sector that covers activities uh, that are human-induced land use activities that essentially can contribute or remove GHGs, namely uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So this includes activities like clearing forests for uh, cropland, clearing grasslands for pasture land, or also reforestation, and uh, Aforestation activities. <coughs> Agriculture is just going to cover cultivation of soil, arable crops, and livestock production. So livestock production is going to be a huge deal in this. And because now sometimes there's sort of a blurred line between what constitutes ag emissions, what constitutes forestry emissions, because in so many cases forests are cleared for agricultural purposes, you can lump the two terms together, AFOLU, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So looking at current emissions, without trying to do too many numbers, um, there, in 2009, according to the WRK, WRI Kate tool, uh, 5.94 gigatons of agricultural emissions were uh, emitted in terms of CO2 equivalent. So this is methane, nitrous oxide, as well as CO2. And 2.57 gigatons of land use and forestry emissions. For those of you who can't visualize what a gigaton of CO2 equivalent is, all of that combined is responsible for 16% of total GHG emissions in all sectors, so transport, energy production, everything. Uh, these are, this map shows who are the largest land use uh, emitters. The darker red are gonna be the larger emitters, and the green are actually sinks, meaning they have enough forest stock to remove significant uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you can see Brazil, uh, Central African, or, Democratic Republic of Congo and Indonesia are the largest emitters. And this graph just shows uh, the top five emitters in terms of forestry. And notably, Brazil at 973 um, megatons of CO2 equivalent. That's greater than all of the next four combined. So they're extremely important to look at here. And these are the top five sinks. Uh, so China is going to be the largest sink, followed by uh, US, Turkey, Vietnam, and India. However, China also has the largest agricultural emissions in the world, as shown by this map. The darker red are going to be the higher ag. So the top five in that area are China, India, Brazil, US, and Indonesia. So ag emissions are a huge deal. And what's causing them? Uh, Sherry talked a little bit about enteric fermentation. In all of the agricultural emissions, enteric fermentation accounts for 43%. In Brazil, that number is over 60%. Uh, other manure-related activities account for a large proportion, as well as synthetic fertilizer use and rice cultivation. Rice cultivation is more of a big deal in the Asian countries. So some of the existing funding mechanisms to, to combat deforestation are listed here. So first we have the UN RED program and RED Plus, which stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation in Developing Countries. Quite a mouthful, but essentially this attempts to put a financial value on the amount of carbon stored in a country's forests. And it provides financial incentives for these countries to pursue low carbon development paths and to stop chopping down their forests. And it does this through um, a few different financial incentive programs. <clears throat> these are just two listed here. These are World Bank programs. So the Forest Investment Program and the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, <coughs> they essentially provide funds to developing countries to bridge the financial gap and help them pursue these low carbon development paths, help them build their red readiness strategies. Uh, and the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility goes a little further than this. Right now it's testing a set of uh, performance-based uh, incentive payments in a set of pilot countries. Uh, Brazil recently signed on, so they're trying to see if these pay for performance incentives can actually work on a large scale. But you can see the funding is, when you compare that to the global level, that's not a very significant amount. So now, looking at our uh, mitigation strategies, <clears throat> first we looked at mitigation potential to choose which strategies to focus on. 
Are these even relevant enough? Can they provide the amount of emissions reductions that would matter? Then we looked at implementation feasibility. Is it going to be relatively easy or difficult to implement these in the face of uh, various political, cultural barriers that Bilal will later talk about? And finally, we use the McKinsey Climate Desk uh, cost curve to do sort of a cost-benefit analysis to see what we're going to get and how much these are going to cost. So this is uh, the four agricultural strategies that we focused on, and these are the proposed potential emissions reductions in megatons of CO2 equivalent per year that we can achieve here. Um, if all of these strategies were implemented 100% without any kind of uh, intervention or resistance from governmental actors or other actors, we would get a total of over 3,000 megatons of reductions per year. But we recognize that this probably isn't going to be the case. We didn't want to be overly optimistic. We recognize there are going to be governance barriers, especially in the developing world, in the African countries, and in Indonesia. <clears throat> so we assume 58% of total potential here. So the largest potential reductions are going to come from grassland management, as you can see, and this includes better nutrient management of soil, better irrigation systems, better fire protection. And this is relatively inexpensive and we assumed 100% potential for that one strategy. Uh, the next best is going to be organic soils restoration, and this is especially important in places with peatlands, uh, like in Indonesia and in uh, Russia. Uh, due to the opportunity cost of preserving peatlands, because there's so much pressure from uh, the palm production industry, especially in Indonesia, we only assumed a 25% potential in this area. Uh, and overall, you're going to see a cost savings when you implement these. $8 billion by 2020 and $3 billion by 2030. We did the same thing for, um, for some strategies for forestry. And as you can see, again, if these were implemented fully, this is our potential we would have. But we assumed uh, quite a bit less than half, half uh, implementation, implementation potential. So the first two, reduce deforestation from slash and burn agriculture and pasture land conversion are going to be extremely important in Brazil and Indonesia. Again, these are the two countries that we decided to focus on. Um, these are also two of the most difficult strategies to implement because where most of the slash and burn takes place is in remote areas of the Amazon um, or remote peatlands where law enforcement is seriously lacking. So we assume 25% potential on those. Um, so I guess the upshot of this is that there's lots of potential to see in forestry and agriculture, but Without being overly optimistic, you can still see that we can get significant emissions reductions here at uh, almost 5,000 megatons per year. All right. <laughs> uh, so in both sectors, we see a number of barriers that inhibit progress and make it difficult to achieve the full potential. And that is the reason why we are for those. So we're looking at technical barriers. We're looking at governance barriers. We're looking at market related barriers. So for the agriculture sector, first of all, the uncertainty risks and high upfront costs for smallholders especially, because smallholders lack or have little or no access to formal credits in developing countries. It makes it very <coughs> difficult for them to think of anything other than their immediate planning horizons. Similarly, the decreasing sizes of farmlands that, that they hold as a result of fragmentation through land sealing acts or through inheritance further decreases their incentives to invest in that particular land. It also makes the land less productive. Politically motivated subsidies and subsidies in general also change the incentives and may incentivize bad behavior in terms of overproduction, increasing farmland expansions, which may have negative effects on GHG re reductions. Uh, we see that between 2010 and 2013, Brazil's agriculture subsidies doubled, and they now range around $10 billion. Similarly, Indonesia spends around 90% of its 90% of its agriculture subsidies on fertilizers. India's subsidies for its cash crops has not only increased by around 70% in the past decade, but they also subsidized the cost of energy to cultivate those crops. <coughs> so and stuff. These politically motivated subsidies are, just in, are generally subsidies. They stifle innovation. They decrease the incentive to invest in more efficient measures, and also. Most of the advantage of these subsidies go to the large corporate style producers rather than the small farm workers. Similarly, poor R&D, lack of access to information, access to information about land quality, nutrient content, 
and the lack of trained human capacity, in, especially in the rural areas in developing countries, makes it difficult to develop and scale homegrown solutions as well as adopt those that have worked in other countries. Lastly, industrial and political dominance of large agribusiness and input like fertilizer companies greatly inhibits progress in this sector. Uh, you see the pump oil industry in Indonesia dominate and put pressure on the government. Similarly, uh, the soy and beef industry has a lot of influence on what happens in Brazil. To overcome these barriers, we essentially recommend focusing on a handful of countries which are politically stable and are doing things already. So talking about Brazil, talking about Indonesia, talking about the US, China. We look at, although the forestry sector has a lot of potential, almost double the potential of that of the agricultural sector, we see that the cost saving advantages and the economic benefits can drive innovation, can drive research, and can drive the adoption of the mitigation strategies in the billion. Uh, agriculture is mostly a story of changing behaviors, which is very difficult, slow, and difficult to incentivize. For small holders, we suggest scaling up and continuing assistance in terms of better access to formal credit markets, increased crop insurance and drought insurance, as well as looking into ways of improving the access to technical services. A lot of countries are doing that. In fact, most of the countries are involved in all of them to a certain degree, but the government has to intentionally align what's already doing towards reducing GHG emissions as well. Uh, for larger organizations and uh, supply chain actors, we think that governments and NGOs can incentivize better corporate behavior, essentially, by using <coughs> taxation policies, tax incentives, as well as creating spotlight effects on the supply chains of these global manufacturers. We see an example of this in Oxfam's Behind the Brands campaign, which looks at these large multinational corporations such as Nestle, such as Coca-Cola, and sees where they're sourcing, sourcing their product from, what kind of sustainable practices they're engaging in, celebrating the successes, and pointing out the areas of improvement. There's also movement within the industry. We see that uh, in Brazil, there is the Global Roundtable on Sustainable Beef, and it's an initiative started by the industry themselves to improve their sustainable practices and also to improve the quality of the beef they're producing. In terms of the forestry sector, the big problem here is monitoring, reporting, and verification. Essentially, it is extremely difficult to put a number on the carbon stock of your forest, especially because it changes all the time depending on macroeconomic pressures and demand. Uh, there are two problems within it. First of all, how to do this, the technical capacity to monitor forest covers is limited in a lot of developing countries. And second, in terms of the common standards, which there are a lot, number of common standards on how you measure these forests and report them, which makes it very difficult to compare different types of projects across countries and decide what, which are more profitable. Similarly, physical market and financial pressures increase the opportunity cost of preserving forests and makes it very difficult for local level actors to conform to national level policy. Uh, we see this currently happening in Brazil where the price of soy is at an all time high and the real is relatively weak, which makes exports, export markets extremely lucrative. Lastly, uh, one of the barriers for the forest sector is sustainable funding. Uh, although CDM provides funding for afforestation and reforestation projects, it's limited to those only and does not apply to other land use, forestation, and deforestation activities. Similarly, the Red Plus does not fund local level projects yet, which can potentially inform national level plans. To overcome the barriers in the forestry sector, we recommend focusing on the two big players, Brazil and Indonesia. We see there are tremendous uh, advantages of increasing the transfer of technology, improving financial access, especially to MRV technology like Landsat and forest cover monitoring systems. And this is a major source why the private sector has kept out and can incentivize a lot of investments if there are proper governance measures in MRV technology. We also see there's a lot of potential for federal governments to incentivize public-private partnerships. And there are examples in Indonesia where major logging com companies have partnered with local communities to develop sustainable logging plans as well. Lastly, the expanding of the CDN's mandate, although difficult, is very important because that is required to fund the gap between the Red Plus funding and incentivize people to come up with more projects to protect forests. This is something that's already happening. Last year's UN Warsaw talks had this in their agenda, talking about how to increase these 
how to include more forest-related activities within the CEF. Overall, the Lulu CEF and the AF LOU, whatever you call it, sector, is dependent on focusing on a number of set players and seeing how we can leverage the market incentives, how we can improve monitoring, reporting, verification, and how we can invest and expand current ex uh, capabilities to improve the GHG emission reductions. Next, we will hear from the transport sector. Thank you.